Welcome to Inside View. I'm your host, Joel Metzger. Joining me on today's show is Congressman Tom McClintock. He represents California's 4th District. Welcome, Tom. Well, thank you. Really great to have you on the show. So this is part two. Um, we have you on for two shows today. And we just got ta uh, finished talking about drought and wildfire. And if anyone missed that, we encourage them to check out that episode. Uh, but we're going to just move right on to some more issues. And uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is immigration. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been a very hotly debated topic as we um, hear the presidential candidates talking about it. And uh, the effect on California is a, a very affected state by immigration. Mm -hmm. Would you first kind of go over uh, how immigration has changed over the years and, and how you'd like to see the Republican Party move forward with handling this? Well, immigration is the foundation of our country. Uh, uh, we are a country of immigrants. We all trace our ancestry to other countries. How do you create one great nation from all the nations of the world and fulfill the motto of the United States, e pluribus unum, from many one? Well, it's a process of assimilation. It's, it's founded on the notion that when immigrants come to America, they come with a sincere desire to become Americans in all ways and in all things. They acquire a common language, a common culture, and a common love of American constitutional principles and a devotion to those principles. Our immigration laws were written to support that process of legal immigration. Uh, and that's a great strength to our country. And by the way, millions of people are, are obeying our laws, seeking to become Americans. Um, all of this is threatened by illegal immigration. Uh, if we're going to tolerate, much less reward, illegal immigration, then there's no purpose to legal immigration, and that very foundation that uh, our country is based upon uh, crumbles. Uh, you know, we look at the, the uh, uh, way that, that this massive wave of illegal immigration has, uh, has completely overwhelmed our public school system, our hospital system, our prison system. Uh, we're, you know, we, we, we hear of the horrific crimes that are being committed by some illegal uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, those are all extremely serious issues. We had two uh, uh, sheriff's deputies murdered by an illegal immigrant who had been twice deported and had uh, returned to this country through our poorest southern border. Um, but all of those uh, 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 dangers, um, I think, are secondary to the fundamental danger, and that is uh, it destroys the foundation of, of America as a nation of legal immigrants. Um, uh, uh, and, and we should never forget when people say, well, we ought to have a path for citizenship for these 11 million illegal immigrants. My response is, wait a second. We have a path to citizenship. It is a path that is followed by millions of legal immigrants who obey our laws, who respect our sovereignty, who have waited patiently in line. I was talking to a, a, a woman the other day, a uh, immigrant, legal immigrant from Vietnam. Her sister has waited 11 years to immigrate to this country. Finally, uh, the paperwork uh, was completed uh, uh, this past month. Uh, uh, and you know, her response is it was worth the wait. But meanwhile, 11 million illegal immigrants, and probably many more than that, we don't have exact numbers, uh, are trying to cut in line in front of these folks who are coming here out of a sincere desire to become Americans. That's got to stop. Why did, uh, why did illegal immigration become such a problem? Because it wasn't always people always coming here illegally, well, we right? Used to, we used to enforce our immigration laws. It wasn't that complicated. You came here illegally, you were deported and, and, and told not to come back. And if you did come back, you were arrested. Of uh, that all changed, began changing of, uh, many years ago, but has now become an absolute crisis. So, so uh, what are the benefits of having illegals here? Who, who, who's um, benefiting from having a bunch of illegals here? Is it the farmers in California or other people who want cheap labor? Who, who, who wants them here? Yes, I, I, I think it is some uh, sectors of the uh, uh, big business community that like the cheap labor. Uh, but, of course, the, the losers in this are uh, 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 workers uh, whose wages now have been chronically depressed. Uh, uh, and, uh, but as I said, those, these economic damages that are done and the enormous just public cost of providing f uh, free education, free health care uh, for illegals, not to mention all of the fraudulent use of welfare that we are also seeing going to them. Um, uh, th that is a secondary concern. The primary concern is if this continues, 
the United States can no longer function as a nation of immigrants, we become then a segmented of, uh, society of, of warring factions. Of, uh, you know, that's the real danger. Uh, I think a lot of it is politically motivated by this administration. They, they look at this, this enormous wave of illegal immigration uh, from uh, uh, countries with strong socialist uh, viewpoints uh, as a new source of voters uh, uh, to, to replace the Americans who have been completely alienated uh, by, the, by the Democrat socialist agenda. So we, we do have 11 million or so who are here. Uh, many have been here for a very long time. Uh, we do have these costs and these downsides, but do you have any empathy or sympathy for people who have made their lives here and established community ties and love being here and yet they didn't come the right way? Do you see any kind of a a path for them, or, do you, or is your opinion they pretty well, much the, all the, need the to path, go? The path is there for them to use if they wish to obey the laws. That means they return to their own country, they apply legally, they, uh, they, they uh, 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 wait in line the way legal immigrants have been patiently waiting in line. Uh, that's how you show your devotion to our country. But to thumb your nose at our laws, to thumb your law nose at our nation's uh, sovereignty, uh, come here and demand free services uh, and, and all of the protections of laws that you have broken, that is not tolerable. That, this, this cuts right to the question of the rule of law. Uh, and, and I might add one other thing. The people I found who are the angriest about illegal immigration, the very angriest, they're the legal immigrants who've obeyed our laws. Hmm. Then the, the question would be, let's say that uh, the, the nation moves forward and saying, okay, everyone out. One, how would that be accomplished? And two, we've had a porous border. Well, very simply, first of all, you enforce our, uh, the, the current laws that are on the books uh, that make it illegal to hire an illegal alien. Of, uh, once you've done that, and, and, and the other thing is you enforce the laws that make it illegal of, uh, for a, a, an illegal immigrant to apply for welfare. Uh, whenever an illegal immigrant comes into contact with law enforcement or fraudulently applies for services, uh, they're uh, deported. Uh, and if that sounds harsh, remember, that's what every other country does. Hmm. The only difference between our immigration laws and other countries, well, two differences. One, our immigration laws were actually written to provide for, for, for immigration through assimilation. Um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, 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 other countries actually enforce their laws, and we haven't. But we still have the porous border issue. Uh, it seems like if they were able to come through before, even if we said, okay, we're going to deport everyone, what's to keep these people from coming back again? Well, that's why a, a physical uh, barrier is going to be so important, uh, uh, a, a border wall. Uh, that was already authorized by Congress years ago on a bipartisan vote. Uh, and never implemented. Uh, it needs to be implemented. And are you in favor of an actual wall that stretches the, the entire length of our south border? Yes, I am. Uh, 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 it, it has proven very, very effective in countries like, uh, like Israel. Uh, I, I know the Pope has been critical of it, but you know, I notice the Pope has a big wall and fence around the Vatican, and I wager that if anybody jumped over that fence and pitched a tent on the Vatican lawn, uh, they would be promptly arrested and removed. Do you think that under this administration we'll ever see anything moving toward what you have described here, or is it going to take a... Absolutely. I think the American people are insisting on it. I mean, there's one reason why you're seeing Donald Trump surge. Uh, you know, he's, he's actually engaged on that issue. And what we're discovering is he is awakening a great silent majority uh, in this country uh, that uh, has become increasingly uh, concerned over uh, our wide open borders. Speaking of uh, Mr. Trump, I wanted to ask you about the presidential election mm -hmm. and especially uh, the Republican side. We have uh, a lot of different candidates vying for, for the nomination. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on Trump in particular and, and his uh, leadership of the polls and what's going on? What, what, it seems like this is almost an anomaly. I, not many expected him to have this kind of success. Well, uh, you know, he's, he's demonstrated that there is a huge pent-up well of, uh, of support. Uh, for enforcing our immigration laws. I mean, that's really what has, has you know, caused his surge in popularity. Uh, 
I wish he'd approach it a little bit differently. Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, warned long ago that when you argue with your emotions, you will never fail to delight your supporters, infuriate your adversaries, and alienate that vast middle group you're seeking to persuade. I do worry about the way he is approaching this issue, but the fact that he has engaged it so vigorously and has, has tapped a wellspring of public support ought to be a lesson to all politicians uh, that the public is demanding that our borders be secured. Do you think that Trump is a true conservative? I don't. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at, at some of the positions he's taken in the past, he is all over the map. For example, I was very much engaged in the property rights issue uh, after the Kelo decision that basically said the government can seize your home and give it to a private interest of, uh, and pay you just pennies on the dollar for it. Uh, he was one of the worst abusers uh, of, of that, uh, uh, that decision um, uh, and vigorously defended it. Um, now, I do rec recognize people change their views over time. I mean, that's what life is all about. You make mistakes, you learn from the, your mistakes, you change your point of view over time. So and, and to that extent, I'm certainly willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I would enthusiastically support him if he were the Republican nominee. Uh, right now, uh, I've endorsed Scott Walker, who I think has proven himself under fire. Uh, he's also changed his positions every now and then, but as I said, that's what we do as we go through life. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, he took very uh, conservative policies, sold them in a very liberal state, then was able to implement them in a very liberal state, uh, 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 faced the entire uh, vicious backlash uh, of the left, uh, including a, a major recall effort that he was uh, that he prevailed over, uh, and now those policies are working in Wisconsin. People always sound really good on the campaign trail. Uh, it's once they're in office and are tested under fire uh, that you see their true mettle. Um, Scott Walker's been tested and, uh, and has proven himself very well. In a lot of ways, he's got a, a better record in Wisconsin than Ronald Reagan had as governor of California. Now, Reagan made some mistakes as governor, but he learned from those mistakes. That's what made him a great president. But Scott Water, uh, Walker seems to me to, to actually have a better record as governor. Uh, and there's one other thing about Scott Walker. He's uniting our party better than any personality I have seen since Ronald Reagan. And it took Ronald Reagan winning an election to be able to do so. Uh, Scott Walker seems to be doing it right now. You know, uh, of all the discussions I have with my fellow Republicans, um, you know, they're, they're, the liberals hate uh, uh, Ted Cruz. They hate Rand Paul. Uh, uh, the, uh, they hate uh, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, the, the conservatives hate Jeb Bush. They, they hate Lindsey Graham and Chris Christie. Everybody likes Scott Walker. If he's not their first choice, he is certainly their second choice, and that's the kind of unifying um, uh, uh, leader that I think our party needs. Uh, and a man who will stand fast under fire is, is a leader our country needs, and I think we've got that in Scott Walker. Seems like the media uh, keeps trying to portray Jeb Bush as the obvious Republican front runner. You know, he has the yeah. name. It seems like he would be the one, and yet we're not seeing uh, the poll numbers show that yeah. he is just the overwhelming favorite. And the reason why? for that is nobody wants George W. Bush's third term. That's why Jeb Bush will not be nominated and must not be nominated, because nobody wants to go through that again. Uh, and that, 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 by the way, I think is why the, uh, the, the Democrats are in such trouble. Uh, just as nobody wants George W. Bush's third term, we also don't want Barack Obama's third term, and that's what the Democrats are offering. And the good news is we have a wide field of other candidates that are, are offering uh, the restoration of proven policies that produce prosperity uh, and increase individual freedom. Jumping over to the Democratic side, uh, Hillary has just been the assumed, really almost winner, it seems like, but certainly of the, the uh, Democratic nomination, and yet she's been struggling with an email scandal for so, quite some time. It just doesn't want to go away. Do you think that there's merit to what is being investigated? Do you oh, think absolutely that there's a there problem is, yes. there? Oh, absolutely, yes. I think there's a of, of, uh, We have had a number of high visibility cases of people who've gone to jail. Uh, for doing the same thing. I mean, you remember General Petraeus was convicted of, of a felony for doing far less than of, of what Hillary Clinton appears to have done. Uh, I don't think she's going to be the Democratic nominee, uh, uh, and, I, and I haven't for a very long time. Somebody once asked uh, Barry Goldwater, 
what was it like to do, run for president in 1964? And he said, well, it was, it was a lot like trying to stand up in a hammock. <laughs> I'm watching her every day, and she can't get her balance. She's trying to stand up in a hammock. I can't see that campaign lasting much longer. Do you think Biden's going to get into the race? I think so. I, it wouldn't surprise me to see him as the nominee. But again, he'll have the same problem. All he'll be offering is Barack Obama's third term, uh, and that is a guaranteed loser's. Your ideal ticket for the Republican Party? Uh, Scott Walker and then... Pretty much take your pick. <laughs> okay. Last question about uh, presidential uh, candidates. I, by the way, I just, oh, yeah. just think on top of my head. I, Carly Fiorina has proven herself to be a very okay. articulate candidate. She's not proven under fire. She's not held political office before. That makes me a little squeamish, but uh, uh, she she can certainly carry a political tune. <laughs> all right, all right. Do you ever have ambition to? Uh, run for president or, oh, no, or anything no, of that no, nature. No, 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 no. I, I, I have my hands full in, in the House of Representatives. I am very grateful to the people of this district to, to, to allow me the honor to speak for them uh, in Washington. Uh, I am quite content where I am and very grateful for the opportunity to be here. Let's jump over to uh, the Iran uh, negotiations, and I know that uh, Congress is going to be looking at this soon. Can, can you give those who aren't intimately familiar with this a little bit of a summary of what's been going on over there? Yeah, the the the, the president has has reached an agreement with the uh, uh, Islamic fascist regime in Iran that immediately releases to them a hundred and fifty billion dollars of frozen assets that will be immediately available for them to put into their terrorist and military activities. It gives them the legal protection to continue their research and development into advanced centrifuges and heavy water research, uh, uh, the only purpose of which is to develop nuclear uh, bombs, uh, and it gives them legal access to intercontinental ballistic missile technology within eight years. Of, uh, Netanyahu is quite right when he says this doesn't prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon. It paves the way for them to get a nuclear weapon. They have been very clear that is their intention. This, this agreement gives them the financing and the legal protection they need uh, to, to pursue that ambition. Uh, it, is, it is breathtakingly dangerous uh, and I think will rank uh, uh, among the greatest follies in all of human diplomacy. Uh, I, I think in many ways it eclipses the discredited Munich Accords, uh, which historians look back upon as the turning point of, uh, beyond which uh, World War II became inevitable. Uh, uh, this is the same kind of moment in time, uh, and, and the, 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 the bad judgment that went into this is absolutely appalling. So this, uh, this negotiation is going to come before Congress for a review of some kind? What's going to happen there? Well, the Senate requires, or the Constitution, I should say, requires any treaty to be ratified by two-thirds of the Senate. This is a treaty in all respects, except the president's chosen not to call it one. So they've come up with this convoluted process that instead of requiring two-thirds of the Senate to approve the treaty, it requires two-thirds of both houses to reject a treaty. Uh, when we return to Washington in two weeks, I think one of the first items of business is going to be resolutions of disapproval of this treaty. Uh, and I believe that they will be uh, passed by both the House and the Senate. Uh, Obama has said he's going to veto them. Uh, that then raises the threshold. It requires a two-thirds vote of both houses to override the veto. That's going to be a very tall order. It's going to require 270 votes in the, um, in the House uh, and 67 votes in the Senate. Put another way, 13 s Democratic senators are going to have cross to cross party lines and vote uh, in defiance of Barack Obama in order to defend the Middle East from a nuclear arms race and defend the world from a, a, a nuclear armed Iran. Um, like I said, a very tall order. So it, it, it may be fair to say it's unlikely that if it gets to that point that there would be enough votes in order to overturn this? Uh, I, I'm afraid that it's going to be very unlikely. Okay. But, but it's going to play out. We will see. And, and f this is the time to contact you know, particularly our two U.S. senators uh, and raise hell about this. this and, and again, this, this is not a close call. Um, the Israeli ambassador uh, met with a group of us just before we left for recess, and he had an interesting insight into all this. He said, you know, we all expect Iran to cheat because they've cheated on every agreement they've ever entered into. Um, 
But he says, I don't think they're going to cheat big on this. They might cheat little, but they're not going to cheat big because they don't need to. This gives them everything they want and need uh, to consummate their nuclear ambitions. And they've also, you know, I don't think there's anyone who doubts that the Islamic fascist regime in Iran, once it has acquired nuclear weapons, will use those nuclear weapons. And most likely against... Israel first, or? Well, they, uh, this guarantees them intercontinental ballistic missile technology. Intercontinental mm -hmm. means from their, uh, they, they already have the delivery capability to, to uh, 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 deliver weapons uh, into Israel. This gives them uh, uh, right and reach uh, to send those weapons into the United States. So uh, what, I, I always like to ask you, what, why is this happening? Who, who benefits from from this treaty the way it is as it currently stands, why would the president agree to this? I don't know. You know, I, I can state you his reasons, which are just absurd. Uh, uh, you know, what he said is, well, uh, the only the only alternative to this is is war. Well, that is that is absolute nonsense. There is a huge Iranian opposition within Iran. It almost bubbled over in 2009. I am absolutely convinced if Barack Obama had simply stood up as President of the United States in 2009 and said the, the Green Movement in Iran has our complete support, uh, if we had been getting them the material support that they needed and the moral support and leadership around the world that they needed, that probably would have bubbled over then and we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Uh, they had a uh, convention, they have an annual convention in, uh, in Paris, they drew over 100,000 Iranian expatriates there. A huge, huge opposition. Uh, and that opposition was being fueled by two things. The Iranian people were coming to the conclusion that their leaders were international pariahs, and the uh, economic sanctions that were in place were making it absolutely imperative for the regime be overthrown. Barack, that, that's, that's the state of affairs when Obama blundered onto the scene gave the Iranian leadership the legitimacy that they had lost in the eyes of their own people by engaging with them, uh, and then promising to lift the economic sanctions, which were driving the imperative uh, to overthrow that regime. Um, uh, so, you know, when, when he says, oh, there's no alternative, there was an alternative. That alternative was working. Uh, and he absolutely set it back. Which way would you go as opposed to the way the president chose to go? Uh, I would double down on the sanctions, as I say, and be sure that the Iranian opposition had all the material support they needed to overthrow this government. So almost like get involved with their political, give them support, and I mean, I'm not talking about a coup and putting a, a dictator in place, but you think America should get involved in trying to have a change of government there? I, I think the only way to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons short of war is for that regime to be overthrown from within. As I said, it would be the Iranian people overthrowing that regime, uh, but anything we can do to help them uh, would be a very good thing. So in the same region uh, of Iran, uh, and, and, and linked to Iran is ISIS mm -hmm. and their activities. And I know a lot of people have been watching ISIS and, and just with absolute horror and disgust and disbelief. Right. And uh, I was curious to know, do you believe that we are currently uh, engaging ISIS in an appropriate manner, or do we need to do more or do less? Well, the, the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga, uh, which have been battling the Islamic State uh, from the beginning, of, uh, have been in desperate need just of small arms, and we've not provided them. Uh, Jordan's president was here recently, in Washington recently, uh, to beg the Congress for just spare aircraft parts. They're not even asking for whole aircraft. They just need spare aircraft parts to keep their aircraft flying against the Islamic State. Uh, a, a similar situation with Saudi Arabia, uh, and yet they're not getting that assistance from the United States. Uh, uh, and instead, uh, we are putting our, we continue to put our pilots in harm's way under rules of engagement that make it virtually impossible for them to do, to to to, to uh, uh, wage uh, any kind of, of of war against the Islamic State. So do you support, uh, you hear someone like Donald Trump talk about, let's go over there and put boots on the ground, do whatever it takes no, to no, wipe no, these no. out? No, 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 no. First of all, uh, uh, we don't have the, the, the next time we put our kids in harm's way, we had damn well better back them with the full might and resources of the United States. Of, uh, you know, this business of, of sending these young people into wars, uh, and then basically just leaving them over, giving them rules of engagement make it impossible for them to fight back, of uh, uh, scrimping on the equipment that they need, 
of uh, and then hoping something good comes of that. This this just I I, I find it I, I find it mind boggling that that we would do that. Uh, 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 what we need to do the next time we put them into harm's way, uh, and we may have to at some point. Uh, uh, is to be sure that they have all the resources of the country behind them. That means everything else comes to a screeching halt. Uh, all of the resources uh, go to them. They have all of the uh, equipment uh, and support that they need. Uh, we put in a vast, vast um, uh, uh, force and get it over with just as quickly as possible. And that's the kind of thing that should not be taken lightly. That is why the Constitution requires Congress actually declare war uh, before uh, before that take place. There is no way that I would support a declaration of war given our current leadership, given the lack of support that we have given to our military over this past decade, uh, uh, or given the fact that you know the American people, I don't think, are prepared for the kind of sacrifice that, would, that might be required in, in, in such an engagement. Um, we all remember what it was like right after 9-11. There was a patriotism and an outrage that was palpable. You saw it and heard it everywhere you went. Uh, 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 this country wa you know, was ready to commit to take out the Taliban in Afghanistan. Instead, the President Bush uh, uh, told us, well, we'll take care of that. In the we're we're going to bring all of those terrorists to justice. In the meantime, you folks go shopping. That was the message. Can you imagine FDR the day after Pearl Harbor saying, we're going we're gonna to track down every one of those pilots and bring them to justice, and while we're doing that, the rest of you go shopping. I think World War II would have taken a very different and very ugly course. Um, so the bottom line is um, I would not support the use of armed force uh, except uh, when we have been directly attacked uh, uh, and uh, uh, a full declaration of war with the full resources of the country pledged to it uh, is, is adopted. Got it. Uh, so we just have a, a, about a minute left. Uh, for those who want to get engaged with you, ask you questions, any of those sort of things, what's the best way to get in touch with you or see you? Uh, well, uh, uh, I do uh, uh, a number of town hall events. Um, you can get those on my website at mcclintock.house.gov. Uh, I do about every other month we do a large district conference call where I uh, give an update on what's going on in Washington and, and people then can, can weigh in with, uh, with their views. Um, uh, we have our uh, office in uh, Roseville. Uh, the number is 916-786-5560, uh, 786-5560. Uh, and again, on the web, mcclintock.house.gov. So as you go make your way throughout the district, they can see where you're going to be if, and exactly. if you're in their area. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, uh, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us, and we wish you luck in your endeavors in, in Washington. Well, thank you very much, Joel. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside View. I'm your host, Joel Metzger, and I hope you join me next time.